Good evening, everyone. Uh, we'll begin the finance, insurance, and Section 16 lands committee uh, meeting at this time. Uh, please stand uh, for the uh, prayer and uh, pledge to be led by uh, Mike Lagarde. Lord, support each of us in this meeting. We ask your divine help in the difficult task of representing the wishes of others. The issues we address tonight are many, and the solution may not always be easy. Dear God, help us as we serve the school system of Turbon Parish, elected officials, and be with us tonight and forever. Amen. 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 The flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Item number three is matter bearing upon fiscal agent agreement extension. Uh, the committee recommends that the board extend the fiscal agent agreement with Regions Bank for a one year period beginning July 1st, 2022 and terminating July 30th, 2023 and further authorize the board president to sign all necessary documents pertaining thereto. Second. Uh, moved by Stacy Soleil, seconded by uh, Mike Lagarde. Uh, any members of the public wish to address this? Ms. Soleil? Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Lagarde? No, sir. Uh, any other members of the board? Uh, any objection to the motion? Hearing none, the motion passes. Uh, did, I, did I do a roll before uh, we started? No, yeah, let's let the record show that Ms. Soleil and Mr. Lagarde, both committee members, are here, along with Dr. Trahan, uh, Mr. Uh, Ford, Ms. Benoit, Mr. D. Hart and myself, uh, and Superintendent uh, uh, Bubba Longeron, members of staff. Okay. Item four, matter bearing upon student nurse pro uh, professional liability insurance renewal. The committee recommends that the board accept the proposal for Mercer Consumer for student nurse professional liability insurance with limits of $1 million with a $3 million aggregate per any one student with annual premium of approximately $1,045. So moved. Moved by Ms. Soleil, seconded by Mr. Lagarde. Any members of the public wish to address this? Ms. Soleil? No, sir. Uh, Mr. Lagarde? No, sir. Any members of the board? Um, any objection to the motion? Hearing none, the motion passes. Item five, matter bearing upon approval of bid for hunting and trapping lease on section 16 lands. The committee recommends that the board accept the highest bid received, meeting all specifications from Everett A. Bear 2610 uh, Blue Haven Drive, New Iberia, Louisiana, for hunting and trapping lease on section 16 township 17 South Range 13 East in the amount of $7,000 for a five year period beginning August 1st, 2022 through July 31st, 2027 allowing the purchasing department to re-advertise those sections where no bid was received and are those sections in which leases were surrendered and further authorize the board president to sign all necessary documents pertaining thereto. So moved. Moved by Second. Ms. Soleil, seconded by Mr. Lagarde. Any members of the public wish to address this motion? Ms. Soleil? No, sir. Mr. Lagarde? No, sir. Any other members of the board? Any objection to the motion? Hearing none, the motion passes. Item six, matter bearing upon rejection for bid for hunting and trapping lease on section 16 lands. The committee recommends that the board reject the bid received from Rick Wiley, 127, 129 Autumn Ridge Drive, Thibodeau, on section 16 Township 20 South Range 14 East due to non-compliance. So moved. Moved by Ms. Soleil, seconded by Mr. Lagarde. Any members of the public wish to address this motion? Ms. Soleil. Mr. Lagarde, no, any other members of the board? Mr. Ford. I'm just curious what the non-compliance is, if we can get an answer on just kind of what happened and how it's going to go from here. Uh, Ms. Dugat. There was a required document in within the bid packet that they failed to submit, and um, he's been notified and he's going to rebid once they're advertised again. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Dugat. Item seven has been pulled from the agenda. We'll move on to item eight, matter bearing upon approval to advertise for bids on communicator folders. 
The committee recommends that the board authorize the purchasing department to advertise for bids on communication communicator folders. Moved by Ms. Soleil, seconded by Mr. Lagarde. Any members of the public wish to address this motion? Ms. Soleil? No, sir. Mr. Lagarde? No, sir. Any other members of the board? Uh, any objection to the motion? Hearing no objection, the motion passes. Item 9 is original budget 2021 to 2022 special revenue funds. The committee recommends that the board adopt the attached 2021 original budget for the special revenue funds. So moved. moved by Ms. Second. Soleil, seconded by Mr. Lagarde. Ms. Bro, could you come just give us a Reader's Digest version of this uh, adjustment? This is, this is an original budget for, uh, for a grant. It's the Comprehensive Literacy State Development Grant. It was awarded to us mid-year, and so we just had not brought this to you previously in any kind of uh, revision. Okay. Any members of the public wish to address this motion? Ms. Soleil? Yes. Mr. Lagarde? Yes, um, any other members of the board? Any objection? Hearing none, the motion passes. Right. Um, item 10 is the revised budget special revenue funds. The committee recommends that the board adopt the attached 2021-2022 revised budget for the special revenue fund. Moved by Ms. Soleil, seconded by Mr. Lagarde. You want to give us a brief overview of that? Yes, sir. These are all grants that received supplemental allocations throughout the year. Um, these will bring the revised budgets up to, our, up to our actual total allocations for the year. Okay. Any members of the public wish to address this? Ms. Sola? No. Mr. Lagarde? No, sir. Any other members of the board? Ms. Uh, Benoit? Uh, so what, what prompted the increase in some of these uh, funds? Some of them are unspent funds by other districts that they reallocate. Some of them could be additional um, grants that were written that just like programs that had fallen inside of other grants. Um, some of them are um, increases just like some of the um, based on student enrollment, you know, it can the, the um, allotments will change during the year. And some of them are ones that we just have had not been notified okay. until so now by the State Department. Some of them are, are significant in the increase, that's why I was wondering. Yes, and it, it's various reasons depending on uh, which grant you're talking about. Is there one that you had a particular concern about? No, no, no. Okay. We don't have any that are increased because we're um, complying with that uh, rule about the bathrooms. <laughs> None of this has anything None to do with that, no ma'am. Okay. Um, did some of this go to individual schools or uh, parish programs like the homeless program? And All of it is um, district-wide. The only thing that, that's really school-based is the Title I school-wide allocations. These aren't that. These don't include the Title I. Oh, no, sir. Okay. Uh, anyway, any other members of the board? Mr. Ford. Just to make sure I'm reading this correctly, if it's a decrease, it's what's in parentheses, right? That's correct. So everything is an increase with the exception of $416 for SR3 formula funds. That's correct. Okay. I just want to make sure I'm reading this. All right. Um, any objection to the motion? Uh, hearing none, the motion passes. Let's see. Are we on, is that 11 next? Okay. All right. Matter bearing upon variable budgets for fiscal year 21-22, the committee recommends that the board adopt, as presented, the final 2021-2022 budgets for the designated funds that the board allow the final budget for the funds be deemed as a variable budget with estimated revenues set equal to actual revenues, provided that such revenues do not exceed those approved uh, by the board and our state federal regulatory authorities, and further that the final budget for the appropriations be set equal to amounts actually expended, provided that such expenditures do not exceed those approved by the board and our state and our federal regulatory authorities. Moved by 
Ms. Soleg, Second. seconded by Mr. Lavar. Uh, Ms. Spro, you want to give us a little brief overview of this one? Yes, sir. All of our grants and all of our internal budgets, local um, funds are lo listed here. This is to keep us in line with audit requirements and the State Department of Education's requirements that we um, that our budgets equal actual amounts, which we spend everything that we get, and so our budget and our actual end up being the same equal. anyway at year end. But just in case there are any that have carryovers or any that allow fund balance accounts, that we can write those budgets to equal those actual expenditures. And these are all year end budgets, right? Uh, year end adjustments. How long do we have, or am I, if that, and if that's incorrect, and how long do we have to spend that past uh, the fiscal year? Most of them have to be fully spent on June 30th. There are a handful that allow a carryover to September, and then the um, COVID ESSER funds end in June of 23 and June of 24. The majority of them are one year grants, and they go July 1 to June 30th. So the fact that this is going to get approved in July, that won't affect the uh, invoices or anything? Uh, no, no, sir. We're, um, we'll finish paying invoices somewhere around July 7th or 8th, and then we do all of our final reporting to the State Department. Uh, the deadline for that is July 15th. Okay. Um, any other members of the board have a question? Uh, any objection to the motion? Hearing none, the motion passes. And then the monthly budget to actual and the monthly sales tax collections update, Ms. Bro. The uh, monthly budget to actual comparison reports are there um, in your folder, as well as the sales tax collection spreadsheet and graph. Sales tax collections for the month of April, April, yes, we're up 14.7% as compared to last April. Any questions for Ms. Bro? Uh, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn the finance insurance okay. section 16. Moved by Ms. Silla, seconded by Mr. Lagarde. Any public? Any objection? Motion passes. Thank you, Mr. Hamner. Uh, the executive committee will come to order. Uh, 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 in attendance tonight are myself, uh, Mr. Lagarde, member. Also in attendance is Ms. Sole, Mr. Ford, Ms. Benoit, Mr. DeHart, Mr. Hamner, the superintendent-elect, and members of his staff. The examination of, of invoices for the current month, including supplemental payroll and travel expenses. Do you have any questions, Mr. O? Uh, Mr. Lagarde. I was looking at it. I know uh, some expenses I don't see in here, and maybe you can explain them to me. I know uh, the, do, do we have any invoices for the uh, materials and anything that we spent in the superintendent's new office? Um, we do. I don't have them coded separately, Mr. Lagarde. I would have to pull those individually for you. They're all being coded just to the general maintenance budget. Um, but if we need to, we can pull those separately. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Any other concerns, sir? No concerns. No concerns. Any uh, questions by other board members? Mr. Ford. So, regarding the, the, the what are but uh, I guess people are throwing different terms around, but I'm gonna say the uh, renovations within this building. I know that a lot of it is uh, space that's being cre created out of underutilized space, correct? So when we refer to it as for the superintendent's office, that's, that's not exactly correct. That's, yes, that is one of the spaces that's being created, but there are several spaces that's being created out of under or non-utilized spaces in this building. And I just want to make that known because we can't keep referring to it as the superintendent's new office. You know, the, the office that he's going to have now is actually, if I'm correct, is smaller than the one that the current superintendent had. So it's not really like we're building him a new suite or anything like that, which is what the rumor is that's going around. This is just 
making room for people that were displaced within the district and taking a space that was quite frankly underutilized and a little too big and turning it into a couple of spaces for other people. So I just want to make sure that's clear. We, we shouldn't be referring to it as a superintendent's uh, well, office. Excuse me. Th uh, thank you for that clarification, can, Mr. Can Ford. Any other, uh, any yes. other board members? Mr. Yes. Lagarde. Uh, I didn't know we had anyone displaced, to be honest. I never, that's the first time I heard that we had employees that was displaced, which you said, Mr. Ford. So please tell me we're making space, but who was displaced? Mr. Ford, you have the floor. Who was displaced? Oh. What it was explained to me is from the federal building and curriculum specialists and people within the district. Uh, Never heard of it, but I know, look, I, hey, the public won't answer us. It's their money. We should tell them. Well, and I that's, don't want to hide anything. Exactly, and it, well, if Porter there was Porter, this place. Mr. Ford, Mr. Ford has the floor. Go ahead. You know, that's exactly why I brought this up is because for over a month now, I've been answering those questions to the public and I did do the investigation and I did contact not just Mr. Ogeron, but other people within central office and clarified even with maintenance what was going on and why this space was being created. This is not unusual when you have change of command or you have a new superintendent or even a new anything, personnel director, a new CWA director, you <coughs> have to create spaces that are, you know, more accommodating to those people in those positions. This building's old. We, we have to sometimes renovate and make changes and upgrades and fix things that were broken for a long time and maybe they got overlooked over the last couple of years. No big deal. It's not really hurting us. It's not costing the taxpayers any more money. It's coming out of our maintenance budget. It's already there. So I just think we're making a mountain out of a molehill. This is silly. We should be focusing on the greater picture, which is academics and building curriculum and getting our students up to par where they need to be. Mr. Uh, yes, oh, well, I, you, you are correct with some of it, but you know, my constituents are concerned because they got people that living in mobile homes, their house been destroyed, they don't know how or where they're gonna fix their homes and, and you know, we sprucing up and spending, I don't know exactly how much money and my constituents are asking me questions that I can't give them an answer. When you go down these bayous or some of these areas, their houses are destroyed, and they're like, "Man, what y'all y'all spent all this money and spending this money?" And you know they want to know. And yes, you know it, I don't know. Be honest with you, what percent of the budget it is? Because I don't have an exact dollar amount. And any investigation you did, I wish you would share it with me. You know, because I know we have an architect. You know, now I do know when you get a new person and you buy new furniture, and you made get some new curtains, they may get some paint, but when you architects and do all that, the public should know. So, you know, it's just like you investigate, you hearing it from your constituents, I'm hearing it as well from mine, and I'm sure some of the rest of y'all are hearing it. So I just ask a question. I want to know because they want to know. That's all. Thank you, sir. And uh, just for some clarification. Oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Benoit. No, you go I ahead. I'll, I'll, I'll wrap it up. Okay, with my thank you. Uh, no, I just want to support what Mr. Ford said. I, had all the information, uh, did also investigate what the situation was and learned the same thing that he learned and support what he says. Yes. Shared with me. Will do. I do have uh, knowledge that we have uh, some, dis some uh, offices space that was damaged for the storm at the West Park facility. And uh, people are doubling up with uh, that office space and it's is not being effective and uh, it's, it's not the best thing for the curriculum specialists and the people that work with our students to be able to be most efficient in and I know that we are uh, reestablishing some space in this building for them that I know can I add one other thing that I know that the architectural um, uh, consulting or what was done as far as the planning was um, gratis it was given gratis with no charge. Thank okay. you for that information. Would you like to give us some more? Would you like me to Mr. Ogeron, would you, would you like to make a statement? Should I? I mean, it's up to you, sir. Okay. Well, so, Mr. Lugo, I, I can explain that 15 employees were displaced at the federal building. 15 people. We had a 4,000 foot building collapse, completely gone. 
So we have to find space. So like somebody said here, they're doubled up. They, we put them in meeting rooms and spaces that we didn't have a whole lot of space for. So that, that's kind of what happened immediately. So we're trying to figure out long term how can we best fit people without having to necessarily build a whole new building. So the question is can we maximize what we have here? Can we maximize what we have in West Park? We've got to fit the 50 people. So one of the things I wanted to do, even when I was assistant superintendent, was work more closely with the curriculum specialists. So I've been looking and thinking, how could we do that? Is there a way to pull that off here? Um, so Mr. Martin's office currently is, is connected to what we call the plan room. The plan room is about the same square footage as the five curriculum specialists are in at West Park. If we move the curriculum specialists here, that frees up a lot of space over at West Park to put people who are displaced at West Park who are currently in what we call the big meeting room. There's this big, huge meeting room that we meet with in Cheryl and Monica building that we haven't been able to meet in because there are people in. We need to meet. We, we have so many things we have to cover with principals on down on a regular basis. We've been meeting at South Southdown's got a great space. The problem with Southdown is we have people traipsing through the school that don't need to be in school. Matter of fact, we, we, and we were thinking this before anything happened in Texas or elsewhere. This is not a safe situation. We need to figure out a much more secure space. Our space is secure is over there in West Park. How do we free it up? We can move people around. So where the curriculum specialists were, we can move the people that were in the meeting room upstairs. They also had a space across the hall upstairs that were like for PLCs and other things. As a matter of fact, there's a space that I would go sometimes to meet with curriculum specialists and ICLs. We can free that up for the West Park people that were displaced. That's more space. Another thing we're looking at doing is talking to Cheryl Degrees. We have employees that are housed at West Park that could probably and should be housed in schools. That's coming. That's going to free up more space. So it's all going to create this efficient use of what we have now. Uh, whether I'm over here in a new space that set our curriculum specials or whoever, we need to kind of revamp and get it, get it for somebody. It's, it's going to be me because I think Sandra, as CAO, it makes a whole lot of sense to have her with the people that she's going to work with every day. Every day. That's what I wanted from the beginning for me. And just we didn't have the space or it wasn't kind of, I guess, conducive at the time. Now it works. Now it fits. That's part of the whole plan. Let me just say this too while, while I'm at it. We have a building in Fletcher. Fletcher's, you know, it's undecided as to what we're going to do with Fletcher. There are two options on the table that we've talked about. One was a central office. One was a school. If I had my brothers, it would be a school. Something for kids. Whether it's a magnet school, vocational school, what have you. Something for kids would be ideal right there. It's built for kids. So putting the adults there didn't make sense to me. So how can we maximize what we have? Let's do what we have. And I think you're right. Well, we have to spend a nickel in this building. I sh I, I'm exaggerating. Not a whole lot of money. It, it, if we're going we're gonna to keep this as our space, we can make it a little better. It's not about making it fancy or it's just making it a little bit better. Uh, so that's the vision for this whole thing. Uh, whether or not we can get all this stuff approved as a FEMA project or not, I'm not sure. I'm not going to say yes or no, but I know this. I know that that building, we're going to get money for that class building. Typically, you can take money that's similar space for a similar space, whether it's, it's an office for an office, and you can apply that as what's called an improved project or an alternate project. We can probably take 4,000 square foot building, let's say that's a million dollars, if we get 90% of a million, 900 grand. That's more than what we need to do anything here or in West Park to get the spaces maximized and efficient. That's what we're going to do. We're going to apply it as a FEMA project. Whether it gets approved or not, we don't know. But it fits. Talk to Stevie Smith, it fits. That's an alternate project. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Yes, I have. Are you good? I think that's about what I have to say. I guess I guess I, I, I want to thank you for that explanation uh, because this is the first time we all hear as a board 
collectively. I know that different individuals got information. I got some information. Debbie just revealed some information that she had got. Mr. Ford uh, has been, you know, I, I had mentioned that before what he had just said. But it's the first time that as a board collectively, we've heard that explanation. And I really appreciate you doing that because now it all makes sense and we all hear the same thing at the same time. I was never against the, uh, the utilizing of that extra space. I just did to, didn't know what it was in, you know, being you, the whole picture. I knew bits and pieces. And, and, and I really appreciate your uh, giving that thorough explanation. Um, and I feel much, much more comfortable about it now. And I, uh, and I think probably if that had been told to us from the get-go, uh, and, you know, and I'm not criticizing, I'm not. We probably would have just, you know, those of us that had some concerns may have, you know, would have, would have felt much better. Uh, but it is, it is going to be well, well, thought out utilized space and uh, know it now that it's replacing some space over there that Mr. Green will not get back and who's going to be there. Uh, seeing the big picture of what's being done there, you know, because like I said before, we will get little bits and pieces individually but never never collectively as a board. So thank you for that. I uh, appreciate that superintendent on your own. And that, that any questions I had before, Thank you, Mr. Anyone else? All right. Do I have a motion to accept the all uh, invoices? So moved. Second by myself. Uh, any public comment? Uh, any statements? No, ma'am. Myself. Any other board members? Any objections? <coughs> None heard. So moved. Uh, motion to adjourn, sir? Yes. Motion, uh, motion adjourned by Ms. Lagarde, second by myself. Uh, any objections? So moved. And we move on to uh, education. Policy Committee meeting of um, Monday, uh, June 27, 2022. I'd like to note that um, Dr. Trahan is here as a member, uh, Mr. Ford as vice chair, and myself as chair, along with uh, other board members, Ms. Stacy Sole, Mr. Mike Lagord, Mr. Um, Hamner, and Mr. Roger Dale Dehart along with Superintendent-Elect Ogeron and his staff. Um, the first order of business is a matter pertaining to special use of school buses, and the committee recommends that the school, the board approve, as presented, revised policy file E-3.2A, special use of school buses. Um, I think Ms. Bro, she, she stepped out. I want to her to give uh, an explanation of this policy. Anybody else know the policy? Okay. You want to, you want to say a little bit about it? You can see the added So what we're going to do based on the price of fuel, we'll look at charging 50% of the price of fuel. 
So if the price is five dollars, it would be two dollars and fifty cents. That's kind of a rule of thumb we'll follow mm -hmm. to kind of be fair and equitable and, and not uh, put ourselves in a hole, so to speak, with this, this whole process. Okay. That's kind of a policy change right there. Go from dollar seventy five to whatever fifty cent of the current price of the gallon. Mm -hmm. Makes and sense with the way prices are going. It <laughs> does. <laughs> and, and so that's all we were charging previously was only 50% of the cost of gas? Or we? Okay. Gotcha. We, we, we did an emergency uh, previous to this policy change at $2.50. But uh, the two that applied for uh, bus arrangements. I was just kind of like an amendment we made last evening, but this would be like a permanent policy change. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So do I have a motion? So mm -hmm. moved. Moved by Mr. Ford. Second by Dr. Trahan. Yes, sir. <laughs> uh, any public comment? Mr. Ford? I just want to say that I think this is very fair, uh, and that change is, is only a necessity because of the current state of care, and maybe one day when your prices go down and stay down, Dr. Trahan? No, ma'am. Okay. Any board members? Yes, ma'am. Yes, Mr. Lagore? Uh, I don't have a problem with it, but uh, did we talk to Mr. Obear? Because I know it's a, it's a figure they use and everything. Was he, is he in agreement with this? He was, yes, sir. Okay. That's all. Because I, I, I know we talked about it, but at one time, nobody had never talked with him. If he in agrees, then it's okay. Not a problem. Okay. Mr. Dehart? Yes, ma'am. Uh, I asked for information about this at the same time whenever I saw it, and I can tell you right now, no matter what the price of diesel is today, it's way over five dollars a gallon for diesel. But even the wear and tear, I'm talking about other maintenance, they still getting a good price through us to use it. It's just that we're not going to be foot the bill for so much uh, over overage on on diesel. And right now, our bus is average, possibly around seven miles to the gallon. So what I'm saying to you that that's a burden. <coughs> Nobody can say, you know, uh, we, we, we're not making any money on it is what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. So I just want to clarify that for information. Thank okay, you. Okay, thank you. Any other board members? Any objections? Hearing none, so moved. Uh, third item is matter pertaining to a revised policy um, file F-11.4 sick leave um, proposed by Dr. Trahan. Thank you. Uh, I brought this back to the agenda because uh, I really feel it's an important item that needs to be voted upon by the entire board. And uh, something of this magnitude uh, needs to get out of committee and, and my, in my humble opinion and be voted by the entire board. And it has my support. And the committee recommends that the board approve as presented revised policy F11.4 sick leave. So I move. move. I move. Yes, ma'am. Uh, second. I will second it. Yeah, I'll second the um, the motion. Um, any public comment, Dr. Trahan? Do you have any other? No, ma'am. Thing to add, nor myself. Yes, Mr. Ford. <clears throat> I agree, Dr. Trahan. I think this needs to go to the full board. Um, it was my understanding at the last, at the end of the last meeting, we had tabled it till July, so we'd have a little time to get some facts and figures together. Uh, Ms. Bro did email me some facts and figures um, for what we've paid for substitutes over the last couple of years. Um, so that that is a portion of what I was looking for, but I'd like to be able to compare that. So just the numbers that we have here in front of me. In 2018-19, we spent 1.9 million on substitutes. 19-20, uh, we spent 1.3 million, and there's probably a, a disparity between the two because of COVID that year we left in March. 2021, we spent 1.5 million, which there's probably still, you know, that that's a higher number than I anticipated because of the fact that we did kind of stay away from getting subs that year because of COVID. And in 21-22, we spent 1.6 million, which seems to be in line with the previous year. So those are good facts to know. That's exactly what I wanted, but I'd also like to compare that 
to what it will cost us if we do this. Now, this year is unique in that we do have a superintendent who's outgoing and retiring. And based off this change, he's subject to get an additional close to $30,000 check uh, for that. So I know this year would be a lot different than say what it would be next year or the year after. So I would just like to see those numbers and facts and figures. But I have no problem waiting till board meeting to do that. I would just like to see it, you know, so we can we can discuss it yes. and, and be well informed mm -hmm. at that time. Thank and, you. Thank you, Mr. Ford. And we will make sure that we have all those numbers uh, when we bring this to the board. Uh, any any other board members? Yes. Yeah, I, yes, Ms. So I would like the, the amount, if, if this policy passes, I would like to know what it would have cost us for this year, last year, and the year before. Okay, a, th a three year trend. If, if that's, yes. Okay, yes. we can do that. Yes, Mr. Lagarde. I, I was wondering what Mr. Ford, what you was talking about with, with the subs, what all that have to do with anything? Uh, Mr. Ford, because, okay, so the the rationale for part of this is that when you have teachers that are retiring or leaving the system and it's mainly retiring and they have a lot of days on the books instead of uh, instead of coming to school for those additional 20 days they're staying home so they can you know get that pay without losing it and we end up paying subs to cover when they're out so it's, it's like they have, let's just use arbitrary numbers. Before this, let's say they had 36 days on the books, but when they retire, they only get paid for 25 of those 36. Mm -hmm. So they would stay out 11 additional days to make sure they were, you know, not, at least they were getting paid for that time off. And then in those 11 days that they took off, we'd have to hire subs to cover their classes. Okay. So one of the rationale for doing this is has been explained to me that if we give them those additional 20 days, then maybe they won't miss as many days in that last year before they retire. Okay. Uh, you know, like you see, I, I think we should have moved it further back. You know, guys, y'all keep forgetting that we're in the election year. And I don't know about y'all, but, but my constituents and people are asking me questions. And if I can't give them questions and we can't give them questions, we may not be here. So we got to be mindful of, of that in the timing of situations and changing stuff. And, and the big thing I remember a few years back, one board did put it for 25 days and now we're gonna change it. It just don't pass the smell test. We changing it at the end and someone retiring, you know, would it be a big factor to us that we were discussing this in October instead of now? You know, and another thing, that I get a lot of calls about. Let's look at teachers. We're, we're classroom teachers. We're not talking about administrators. We're talking about that classroom teacher. You know, classroom teachers don't don't leave. As, as when I was a teacher, I went to work. I wouldn't worry about days. You know, you, you, you went to work. I always worked two or three jobs after, but I went to work. And I don't think anybody, because one time I heard, well, you know, that going to encourage people to go to not to go to work, but as a teacher, you go to work, you don't worry about your sick days, but personally, I, I don't like to see nobody lose days, but it's just the, the, the timing of it, you know, I, I don't like if we gonna change the rule because we got some people right now that not retired because they're using their days, if, if we gonna pay somebody, and I thought when that other board changed it to 25, you know, that was a good policy, and I don't know why we're addressing the change for 45 days at this moment. You know, it just don't look good. We're spending all this money, and can we afford this now? You know, with all this spending we're doing, and our community is in an uproar, and we're about to get in hurricane season again, and we just spending all this money. I think it should stay the same, you know, as it is, we just spinning and spinning, you know, but hey, maybe we won't be around to answer the questions once it all gone, because we don't know what's gonna happen. So in, in uh, October, but I'm confident 
I'm gonna be here. I'm saying it, but then we still got questions here or not. So you know, we just gotta be mindful. We spending other people money. Well, I'd just like to add, you know, a, a sort of a segue from what your comments that um, this is what Mr. Ford explained is going to be an offset of the money that we're spending on substitute teaching. It's not really adding on top of that. It's sort of taking away from some of that. But also, I will say that we know overwhelmingly that this is supported by teachers. They like the idea of this. And uh, teachers vote. So if you're worried about voting, I mean, though, that's something to consider as well. Um, I just think, I think it's a good thing. It's a benefit that they earn. And uh, I, I think it's something that they deserve to have. And I think uh, also if they know that they will get paid, uh, they may look at reserving some of those days so that they can collect those dollars when they retire. Just my thoughts. We all have different thoughts about it, so just sharing that. Anybody else? Yeah. I just yes, have a quick Mr. comment. Just to, just to yeah. clarify, um, <clears throat> the teachers do not lose those, those if we go from 25, those 20 days, they're not going to lose those days. They, apply, they can apply those toward retirement service time. Only if they, I'm sorry. Yeah. No? It, uh, it just, my, I th my thought out loud, my apologies for interrupting okay. you. They, yeah, it's, because this is changing the policy from taking 45 days, 25 days of accumulated sick days to, uh, and paying them for 45 days of accumulated sick days, okay? The, when you go to retire, some employees, and mostly the extended month employees, have excess days that cannot be reused toward retirement. Mm -hmm. Those are the days that, when, when this idea originally started, we're gonna be the ones to pay them for, right? But this is going to allow all employees, whether they have excess, uh, excess days or not, to use their accumulated sick leave to get the compensated absences. Okay, and it, it's this is not this is not the excess because there'll still be plenty plenty excess days that that they will have that they can still do with y'all or supposedly trying to prevent. Um, and I just want to clarify that. It's not, again, it, it's not you paying them for the excess days. Mm -hmm. I would be all for that. Mm -hmm. well. It's paying all employees another 20 days. And I did some research with Forethought. There are only four systems um, in, in Louisiana, I didn't bring them with me, I think, uh, that have, have a policy that's more than 25 days for the uh, accumulated average, uh, absence pay. Uh, one of them was Point Coupe. I remember, I think they, theirs was 25 days for nine month employees and 37 days for extended month employees. Two others had the exact same policy because Forethought writes this policy at 25 days, uh, I mean at uh, 45 days. And one other, and I'll bring it with me just to share with y'all. One other, it was uh, 25 days, but the board added an addendum to that, that at their discretion, they could up it to 40, uh, up to 45, um, for all employees, I think that's the way it was. But anyway, so we would be the one, two, three, one of four or five parishes that has a policy different from um, from the 25. I, I, I'm not against giving retirees. I'm I'm, pre I'm vice president of the Louisiana Retired Teachers Association. Anytime I find somebody that's or, or, or a parish that's given extra money to retirees 
I'm all for that. Um, I think the the more we can give, you know, our retirees when they go on when they leaving, the the better. Uh, I'm just questioning whether or not it's the most efficient use of our funds because 25 is the norm across the state that can be verified and I would much prefer to see that money go to our returning employees. They need a raise and this, this is, and you were right uh, last two weeks ago that it's only, uh, even though it's an increase of Two point million, I think, uh, of the of the nine million. It's going to go from six to eight or something like that. I don't have the numbers in front of me, but you, if you recall, they were pretty high. But that's and that's the total. You mm -hmm. but you were correct. That's if everybody retires. That's if everybody retires. But you still have to account for that nine million dollars. Okay, it's still a, a a financial liability on the books even though it's only going to be 200,000 this year, 210,000 next year, maybe 190 the next year, you still have to account for the total amount. Sure. So, well, it, so, it, but again, I'm, I'm, I'm not against giving retirees, uh, people retiring the extra money. I'm just questioning, you know, what, what are we going to give to our returning employees, couldn't that be something that would be better spent on return on the returning employees? Plus, Ms., if you don't mind me using your name, Ms. Soleil, Ms. Soleil brought out a good point on several other occasions too that we don't know what this rebuilding is going to cost. Okay, and um, should we be spending extra money for something that's really? Uh, not being asked for, because I, I, I haven't gotten any, any teachers, not a one, not a one, and I know a lot, that uh, have called me and said, oh, please Clyde, pl pass this. Yeah. I, but I did get a couple of emails today, are y'all going to give us a raise? And I can show, them to, I can show you those texts. Um, you know, that's just my feelings on it. Um, thank you for letting me say that. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hamner. Um, well, I got this from Miss uh, Annette Lagarde. Is it? Is that her last name? Foray. Foray Lagarde, who has polled the teachers and has said overwhelmingly she's getting this approval from the teachers for this. But the other thing is, you talked about uh, using the um, your sick days towards retirement. There is a cap to that. You can only use so many sick days. So you still can have some left over. That's right, but Beyond. this doesn't address that. That's what I was trying to explain. Well, I mean that but, it's the, the but leftovers it, is what. Uh, and we're speaking out of order. I'm not. I don't have. A, I don't have the mic, but I don't want to debate. Yeah. On it. No. I'm I, all I'm it. saying is that doesn't an employee have a, a, the option to decide whether or not they're going to use that mm -hmm. towards retirement or take the money? They do. I mean, it's their mm -hmm. days. It's their benefit, and it is a benefit that the teachers earn. Okay, Mr. Ford. I just, I have one more point to make and it kind of goes along with what you brought up about Miss Annette uh, Forey Lagarde polling the teachers. I mean, if I would ask anybody in this room, you want a piece of cake? 90% of you are gonna say, yeah, I'll take a piece of cake. But if I give you an option of saying, you know, I'll give you $10 or this piece of cake, you know, most people are gonna take the $10. So, of course, if we're offering them something, hey, would you like to have 45 days instead of 25? Of course, I'd love to. But we're setting policy here. And, and one of the things I always refer back to, and I know you, get, you, get, you guys get tired of hearing about it, but it's the military, right? Uh, traditionally, in the military, we're allowed to bank up to two months or twice, twice the amount of your annual leave. Well, everybody in the military gets 30 days of annual leave. So you're able to bank 60 days and you get paid one thirtieth of each month's salary per day, right? So if you if you have sixty days on the books, you end up getting paid for two months of your two month salary when you retire. You can sell those back, and it does go towards your retirement points, but you can sell those back. Um, here, if you're talking about a teacher, they get what is it ten days a year? So 
twice our annual leave for a teacher would be 20 days. We're already at 25, which is double that, or which is more than what twice would be. So I, I'm, I'm sure they would be pleased if we did do this for them, but at the same time, I don't think many people are, are asking for it. However, like Mr. Hamner said, I've been getting questions about teacher pay raises and in particular because they're seeing other districts in the area giving their teachers raises. And I don't want to sound like a broken record, but I've brought it to this same committee five times now asking for raises for our employees and it has yet to make it to the board. So I'm not saying that's a motivation not to vote for this because I want this to go to the board. But I also want this to go to the board knowing that next month when I ask to bring a teacher pay raise or actually an employee pay raise throughout the district to the board, I'm hoping I get the same result. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ford. And I just like one other point. Um, Mr. Hamner referenced the fact that we have a lot of building expenses, but I, there, there's two pots of money. What we're doing for building doesn't go for, for teacher raises. Um, just like our, our taxes are appropriated just for salaries, not for buildings, and another would be towards buildings. And we do have FEMA as well that we're counting on to reimburse us for that. So I think one doesn't really affect the other. Um, yes, Ms. Dr. Trahan. Just one point that I need to clarify for my mind about whether these days not used or paid for will be lost by the teachers. I understand that unused pay, uh, because let me use myself as my as an example. When I retired, I had 21 years. I had to live over 100 days of sick leave accumulating. Uh, I was paid for 25. The rest was changed into service credit because I did not, I had not, got, because I started teaching at an older age, I did not have enough years to get to full retirement age. So that way I did have service credit that I needed. But those of us that started right out of high school to college went to teaching. Get that 40 years in, way before, probably younger than I retired, and uh, they have no need of service credit because they're already at full retirement. Mm -hmm. So they get paid for 25 and there's nowhere else for those days to go. That is my understanding. You know, I don't know if that's correct or not, but those are the people that are losing days that they worked and earned and worked for their whole careers. You know, if I could get some clarification on that, that would help. Yeah, it's a good point, and we will make sure we have that when we come to the board. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, Mr. Hamlet. You're 100% right, Dr. Trahan, about those days. Those are what I keep referring to as the excess days. If it would, we're paying them for 20 more excess days that cannot be used for retirement purposes, I'd be all for this. But we're paying them for 20 more days that they can apply for retirement if they choose not it, to take it up front. Okay? They're not going to lose those 20 days. It's, okay? You can get up a night, uh, it was capped. It was day for a day up until 1988 that you could apply your, ex, your, your accumulated sick leave toward retirement. After 1988, there were two different charts that one chart limited it to a certain amount and another chart limited it to a certain amount uh, up to one year. Right? Some of us, when we retired, like yourself, we had some extra days that we didn't get toward retirement, all right? I gave mine to the sick bank at that time. Some people, you know, may have needed those extra days toward retirement, you know, to, uh, to take a day here, a day there. Some people do use them a day here and a day there, but I don't think everybody does. I talked to two different teachers. I said, what are you gonna do with your 20 extra days that you have when you, fin when you retire? his response directly to me was, I hope nothing. Meaning the only way he would want to use them is if he got sick, okay? Uh, we do all know of teachers 
supervisors, uh, upper level administrators that have a lot of days because the retirement systems give them um, 18 days. A 12 month employee gets 18 days to apply toward retirement. The 10 from the school system plus eight more from the retirement system. And that's why upper level uh, supervisors and, uh, and 12 month employees, 11 month employees have so many excess days because uh, even if they used all 10 of the days that are given to them by the school system for 30 years, they still gonna have for the number of years that they were a 10, 11, or 12 month employee, extra days to get their severance pay. And that severance pay, uh, it's not called severance pay, by the way, it's called compensated average, uh, absence pay. You know, for some reason, the state doesn't like that word severance pay. Um, so I just, you're right, you're right about the, the, they do lose the excess days. They don't lose the accumulated days uh, that are less than a year. All right. Uh, one other point that I'd like to bring out, um, Mr. Hamner, uh, when we first brought up this uh, issue uh, several times ago, uh, you had made mention that it wasn't um, approved by the state for us to do, by the state legislature to increase the amount of days. No, no ma'am. Yeah, you did. Oh, then I must have been mistaken because you we, were. Uh, uh, my point was we can go minimum of 25. Right, right. I don't think I ever said that you couldn't go above 25. I, I think you did. I, I mean, I, I know you did, but I have in here. Well, I apologize if I gave you misinformation, but I don't recall saying that. Well, we, I have copies of the state legislative policy. But that's not from me. For that's, everybody, for a copy yeah, for everybody yeah. that I was going to give uh, in regard to this issue. Any other comments? Uh, any objections? Hearing none, so, so moved. Okay. Um, the next matter is uh, that pertaining to instructional staff updates, and it's just information only. Um, it regards elementary, middle, high school assessment and accountability and uh, special education, federal, and child welfare and attendance. Um, Ms. And Ms. Benoit, if I Ms. can LeBose. preface it, I can preface it, yeah. Okay. So, so typically, uh, Ms. LaRose, CAO, will, will kind of lead this piece. She is on annual leave okay. um, out of state. So Ms. Vauclan is going to take, take over. This is something we, we kind of talked about just uh, on a monthly basis, just giving highlights and updates from each department. Just hit the, the, just the, the main points about what's happening or maybe some things that may have happened that are worth kind of sharing uh, to the whole committee here. So that's kind of where we're at today. They'll, Tonight may be a little longer than normal because we're kind of catching up with a lot of things that happened from uh, 2022. So thank you, Kim, for taking it and every supervisor for putting us together. Thank you. On a lighter note, you, in an effort to uh, keep you all abreast of what we're doing in our different departments, uh, we set up a little PowerPoint, a little short, and we're going to be quick, quick, quick. Just touch the keypad and say, see if that's that 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 Okay. Okay, so uh, the state has approved some new social studies standards in 2022. We're not going to be implementing them until 2023, but we're going to start training our social studies teachers on those new standards. We have a lady, uh, Dawn Binus, from Social Studies Success. She will be coming August 1st through 3rd to kind of uh, help the teachers, social studies teachers get used to what's gonna be happening. Um, this is something that I know um, elementary people like. Uh, we compared the end of year Dibble scores 
from um, the 2021 year and the 2022 year. This is a composite uh, end of year scores. And if you'll notice, we actually went up this year than the year before, even despite the hurricane. It seems like uh, the kids were learning some good things in wow. K-2, so that is good news. Uh, English language arts, uh, we do have up, uh, updated guidebooks in grades three to five, and really the only difference is they're adding a writing component to it. It was lacking, teachers were kind of concerned because there was enough writing in the guidebooks for three to five, so they're implementing uh, an updated writing part of guidebooks. We wanted to make everything new optional. And this is one thing. Schools, you can use it if you want overwhelmingly. They all say they all want. It. So there's one of the things that is something else, but it's what they were kind of seeking. I want to say one was like no, school, and then yes, they got talked into it real quick. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I taught fifth grade when I first started teaching years and years ago and we did the aquatic field trip. It was the best thing ever the whole year. The kids look forward to it. They do it in fifth grade every year. Um, they're now uh, over there by the uh, new, you know, Bioland Park. We used to go to the Ponashan Wildlife and Fisheries. That was awesome, but of course it's not there anymore. So it, they really enjoyed this. And all the fifth graders in the entire district go on this. And they learn boat of safety. They actually fish. Every school said a couple of kids caught fish. I don't know what they got in that water over there, but they caught some fish. They love it. I mean, they talk about erosion, boater safety. It's really great. Yes. Um, this year, Sea Grant, we uh, picked two of our eighth grade schools, Lacash and Grand Kaya Middle, and they paid for them to go to the Wetlands Acadian Cultural Center. They reached out to Mr. Cotton. He got with me, we got with the schools. They had a wonderful time. And that was free of charge to us because it was at a grant and they loved that. I wish I could have gone to see that because that was just more fun. Uh, math, teachers and intervention content leaders just recently uh, were involved in a, uh, math. a training, Eureka Math, uh, called Power Up and it's for three to six grade. Um, the reason Eureka Math squared is a little better for the teachers is because it takes some of it with out of it like it was so much information in Eureka math they were having trouble deciphering what they should use and shouldn't do use so they took some of it out kind of streamlined it mm -hmm. so it's easier and look they loved it, and, um, and it it's uh, it gives teachers much more time in the year to get everything, everything done where they will press hard press to get it all in it would be a whole lot easier yeah, it was hard to get through the modules and the time they wanted you to get in. So this is better. This is but training. Yes, this is the training. They were doing a fluency game. Uh, they wrote commitments to do, to use the curriculum, wrote them down on uh, airplanes, paper airplanes, and they threw them across the room, and you had to read somebody else's commitment. It was real cute. They had a good time. And they broke up, they took a lesson and they broke it, went into it. It's fluency, launch, learn, land. And uh, they really, it was good to get into that. They enjoyed that. And this is just a couple of more things. Science of reading. All three, K-3 teachers are going to be trained in the science of reading. Amplify Science is going to take the place of FOSS kits in K-2. to uh, In-class interventions were just the K-4 to schools. This year we're going to do it in K-6 schools as well. And like we just said, Eureka Math squared grades through the six. On a last note, honors program six to 12, Mr. Talbert and I uh, met with uh, curriculum specialists and uh, Louise Barilow and Mr. Dr. Bro about vamping the honors program. We don't think it's, they're challenging the kids in honors classes enough. And they have a 10 point scale, which is actually easier and they're doing the same thing the regular kids are doing. So we talked to Dr. Burrow about getting with GT teachers and honors teachers to come up with some um, activity-based uh, uh, projects for them to get grades. So we're gonna be doing that when school starts, getting some teachers together. So, okay, high school.
Oh, can I ask a question, Kim? First, uh, I didn't want to interrupt you while you were going through everything, but um, what about uh, LumCon? Do y'all not do anything with LumCon with science? Well, LumCon was destroyed. Well, not destroyed. It hasn't been open since the hurricane. Okay, so so usually, usually that is a personal school field trip. Like the school chooses to go to LumCon. They are. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Oh, yeah. Okay. 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 Okay whether it be our students who really excel at uh, TCT, Skills USA, that kind of thing, which they just came back from uh, last week. Also, obviously, EMT and that kind of deal. Well, something we haven't touched on in a while is dual enrollment. Just to show you, building on the success that elementary is having and middle is having, we're seeing the, uh, the numbers coming back up as well. So if you look at starting from the bottom up, the number of students, 101 back in 20 when the COVID it's 133 students, and then we bumped to 168 this year. And again, that's all four high schools. Uh, and also it includes our articulated credits that are being given through our TCT programs as well. So meaning, just so if you guys aren't familiar with the term, so our high school teachers are teaching the college credit at TCT, so our students are able to get their articulated credit. Uh, number of courses taken by those same students, as you can see, it's, it's really increased the number of kids taking multiple courses. Um, 221 back in 20, 320, and 493. And then of that, which is we roughly about a 90% passing rate of a C or better. So, uh, and keep in mind, C or better. So, if you drop the course, make it D or an F, we count that as a failure. So, um, with that being said, we're seeing about a 90% passing rate uh, of the students. So, it's showing that the quality of student that is taking it, taking it seriously. And I might add, too, SCA funding with Bessie, um, with some of the things that Corey shared with me as well as I mentioned that I think a while back that uh, there are bumping the SCA allotment up to um, seventy dollars per person out of uh, seventh grade and above. So, and so we're, we are constantly looking at different ways we can use or increase our um, programs and program offerings, and hopefully that definitely will continue. What's that, sir? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And and just might add too since we have. I know Fletcher, I'm not sure if Nichols is doing it, but I know Fletcher is moving to an eight week course um, that their traditional students are gonna do eight weeks. It's not affecting our students. Our students can, if they have the space, like you know, some of our seniors, some we do have an increasing number, by the way, that the seniors, where they're not even coming to our schools, they just going straight to college for that senior year, so, and it's on our dime. So that's something that we're trying to encourage our so-called graduating juniors don't graduate, stay with us, and then you just go for a year on us. Um, and then, and then I just want to yeah. add to that, we're having a bigger push from our systems office to do more dual enrollment, higher ed is. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you will see an increase in yeah. what they do. And, and there are some changes with it, uh, and I'm sure it's coming from Nichols too, but I know we met with Fletcher where they are, they, they usually give you a little discount for dual enrollment, but they're pulling back on that because of COVID and a lot of things have affected enrollments. So it's affecting their bottom line. So it's really not gonna affect us because we tend to have quite a bit of money in that account. So uh, so that's not a big issue. And thankfully, Mr. Overall is gonna continue the program as long as the money is there, where we reimburse students who pass the course for their textbooks. So, and then we're also trying to figure out ways that there's some fees associated with some courses as we all can relate to that aren't necessarily covered by tuition, like a parking fee, for example. Um, and working with, if they can count that as a tuition piece, <coughs> really, we're trying to do whatever we can to limit the um, the restrictions of a student right now. Because if a kid looks at, hey, 50 bucks to me, you may not be that big a deal. 50 bucks to a family, that's a, maybe a, a week's mm -hmm. worth. Well, used to be a week's worth of groceries, <laughs> but not anymore, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. we, we don't limit kids uh, to like one year old class. Like we, we just say, just whatever's kind of towards your major and it helps you down the line. So it's not about the points for us on SBSI. Mm -hmm. That would be 
And if I could real quick, Mr. Ford, on with, in, in Mr. Ogeron, I'm sorry, because so seven years ago we had a stipulation that the kid would take six, but if they want to take nine hours, not courses, but hours, that it was a stipulation that they had to go through all kinds of hoops and hurdles. But again, we have the funding there. And so being, as long as that funding stays as healthy as it is, is that working with Mr. Ogeron and Mr. Martin, we developed if the kid's capable of doing it, the counselors are good with it, the family knows that this is going toward their graduation and their uh, GPAs and all that good transcripts, then let's rock and roll. And, and we've, thankfully, we've had a lot of success with it. Um, as a matter of fact, the, the test case was a student at Eleanor, as a matter of fact. She didn't have the score for ACT, but she had the academics. And when the counselor spoke up for her, and thankfully, uh, I believe, I don't remember exactly, but she definitely made a beer in any of the courses that she took. So and that really, again, that's one of those things that we learned even from COVID, can we increase it? And we've had some success with it and continue to do that. Mr. Ford. I just have a comment. I, I'd really like to see, and, and I haven't heard anything negative about <laughs> guidance counselors recommending this, but I'd really like to see a push for uh, not just our top honor students, our 3.5s or better, also our, our student athletes, because as you guys know, uh, not just student athletes, but all extracurricular it's becoming more and more competitive. And what universities are having to look at is, has this student taken a dual enrollment course versus you know, have they not? If they're comparing two students with the exact same GPA, let's say they're rated the same on the field as an athlete, if one of them's taken a dual enrollment course and they've done well and they're successful, they're more prone to go to that student to offer them a scholarship because they know they can handle the workload. So I'd really like to see a push not just athletics, band, and these other areas as well, of our guidance counselors saying, hey, Lil Johnny, you want to play D1 football? Let's go talk, and let's talk about dual enrollment your last two years, or at least your senior year, so you can kind of prove that you're worth the, the trouble that the university may put forth. Mm -hmm. So That's I just important. want to see a push for that if we can do that. Yep, thank you. And, and to build on that, Mr. Ford, and I, I couldn't disagree with that. Building on that, um, it is obviously all the, the program's open to any kid who qualifies. And uh, working with Dr. Austin, and not to steal her thunder, I'm not sure if that's what she'll mention that next. But so we're working out ways to get students get the ACT behind them earlier, especially using Mr. Degrees as some of Mr. Degrees' funds as well to try to get the students where they're eligible to do dual enrollment. And they can do it without the ACT, but the ACT is the, the kind of the catch-all. So, um, but yeah, building on that, we're definitely open to all. Mm -hmm. And again, it goes back to what we've talked about. In the past, an 11th grader comes up to you and says, hey, I'm graduating. Mike said, okay, good, congratulations. Now, through all the conversations we've had with parents and things like that, with COVID and making sure schedules were unique to that student or trying to work out schedules that would help the student the best, one of the things that we started really pushing is just that, is that we're asking those further questions. What are you gonna do the senior year? And many of them was, I'm going to college. Well, let us pay for it. And so, um, and thankfully, I think more are taking advantage of that when they realize they can give them money without a scholarship. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't count against their tops either, because they're still, in a sense, a good return. Because it's good for them to Yeah. They're not necessarily a full student. Even though they, they can take, just talking with Kelly, they can take a full ride at Nichols, 15 hours even if we pay for it, or 12. But they're still, it's not going against their top eligibility because it's on, they're not necessarily a full student. So that helps them out too. Cool, next. Excuse me, Minister. Yes, sir. How did that, uh, how did that kid from uh, TCT do with Skill USA, the, the young guy with the automotives? I'm not sure. I know Miss Mika was here today and she was talking about one of the students that was supposedly offered a job. But he's only 15. Yeah, yeah, I think that was him. Yeah, that was him. <laughs> so he couldn't take the job. So, uh, yeah, I'm assuming that was him, Mr. Lagarde, because again, I think that was the only 15 year old we had. Yeah, young. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> Good evening. I'm going to give you some updates about assessment and accountability. And um, the first thing I want to say is if you look at the numbers on the screen, I can say that we've tested probably close to 14,000 tests or put together 14,000 tests with our kids. And um, we finally finished the 21-22 uh, school year with testing on Thursday of last week when we finished um, high school retesting. 
um, and all the different tests are here and they're broken down for you so you can see uh, how many students or how many tests we actually gave in each category. And out of over probably 14,000 tests, we only had 14 boys. So I'm very proud of our teachers, our school test coordinators, our students for their hard work in making sure that our testing um, system went very well this school year. And of course, um, we are preparing continuously for G testing, which we do for our adults that are in adult ed and then choose to come back and test. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes, no, I know. They're like eight. <laughs> Not that old yet, but no, I still, I still give. In fact, we have a student that we're working with right now. Uh, in their forties. That's what I was thinking. So, but you know, we want to we'll do everything we can to help them get that diploma. Uh, plans for this next year coming up. We are working this summer, of course, on our pupil progression plan, and we hope to bring that to committee to you in August so you can vote on it in September so we can meet our department deadline for the state. Um, like Mr. Tolbert said, we are doing ACT this fall for the first time for our juniors. So this year coming up, our juniors will get to take the ACT in November and again in the spring. And we're really excited about that because that will give teachers the opportunities to see um, what their kids are um, doing well in and what their kids may need some extra tutoring uh, before we get to that spring test. And then um, I really had a great uh, conference at Teacher Leader on ACT, so I'm really excited to talk about some things we can do to help our students this next year, uh, getting a bigger bang to our buck with what we do for ACT prep. Uh, a question about ACT. I saw you had 900 and something ACT tests. Uh, is that the average of what you normally do, or is that That's lower? on the low end. I, yes. I thought that should be in the low that end. That is just our juniors who have to take it by the State Department, and we offer it to our seniors free of charge. Um, and then we also do work keys. And so I don't have those official numbers yet. I'll get that in the next week or so. So you think that number represents more juniors? No, this 931 are our juniors that took the test. But you got seniors attempting yes. to increase too. So our seniors are not included in that number. That's why I think the oh. 12,000 is up to 14,000. Okay, so that's just yes. juniors. Okay. Yes. And then um, we are going to be reviewing our third grade testing scores when they come out at the end of July, beginning of August. This past year we gave third graders online. So that meant all of our testing this year was online. We're going to review our data and talk to our teachers and our principals and see what we want to do this year coming up. Yes, sir. Um, to go back to ACT real quick, you don't have to go back to the slide, but our core teachers, English 3, Algebra 2, can we allow them to write SLTs based off of ACT scores now that we're going to have a score in the fall and a score in the spring, or would the score in the fall be too late for them to do that? Because that's one of the problems we see in not so much English 3, but definitely Algebra 2. Teachers are forced to write SLTs, and, and there's no high stakes test or anything to base it off of, so they end up doing a pre and a post test. But that's subjective. Well, they'll have to, they could use the uh, November as kind of a baseline. Exactly. And then we should get our scores back in time. We can't wait till the following November. It has to be in within that year. Yes, yeah, so we'd have to extend their time for writing their SLTs. Mm -hmm. past. That's not a problem to do that. Okay, just just a suggestion. Um, and what like I'll that. do is I'll work with our high school principals and give them that option. And then I'll make sure we have an SLT that's well written so the teachers can use it. Okay, thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you. You're welcome. Well, Mara does a good job, obviously, getting all these people prepared so you can have so few boys and all that. It's just amazing. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, Dr. Bro could not be here. She's at a conference, so she asked me just to review her slides. So for special ed, she kind of did a year in review and she did ch child fine numbers. Um, you can look at the slide and see about how many she, that we did for disabled, gifted and talented, 504, ESL. 
then initial evaluations, how many um, were opened, initial, um, how many were gifted tested, end of the year extensions and talented tested, and then those that are no exceptionality for dis disabled and no exceptionality for gifted and talented. Then re-evals, um, 638, 142 in speech, and those that are new primary exceptionalities that are listed below and the number for each category. And evaluations at a glance, if you look at it, we have decreased each year in initials, re-evals, and preschool. And uh, when I spoke to her about it, she said she's thinking with the reduced population of students, that has something to do with it. IEPs and service plans, um, number of students currently receiving special ed services, and you can see each category, how many kids um, are in each that are receiving services. Discipline and behavior, the number of special ed students with five or, five or more out of school suspensions, the number of manifestation determinations, those are those special ed students that are going up for um, an expulsion. Um, number of special ed students attending TAPS and number of special ed students attending day treatment. And that's all her slides. If you have a question, she said you can email her or call her. Okay. Mr. Ward, do you have a question? I have a, no, I don't have a question for for this, I have a general comment about what Ms. Vauclain brought up earlier about um, honors. So if, if there's another presenter, then I'll wait. But if not, I'm gonna go ahead and say it now. So the honors program, um, she mentioned that you know they do use a 10 point scale and wanna make it a little more rigorous and a little more consistent. I would like to see district wide where our core teachers that are teaching these honors classes can get together in the summer and establish how they're gonna do the honors because, so in, in Lafouche, if I'm teaching the honors class, I have two extra projects that I have to give those honor students in addition to adding to the rigor of my lesson, right? Those projects are good, but that time could be better served doing something else, digging deeper into that, that curriculum. So I don't know if that's a plan, if that's something they wanna do. I know traditionally, Honors classes have been kind of given to the teachers a lot of times that maybe they're not sh such a strong teacher in algebra or, or geometry. Sometimes in English one, English two, they're maybe given to the younger teachers because those students are a little easier to work with a lot of times. But I'd like to see us kind of move from from making you know making it easier for them to where it's actually something they have to earn. I like the idea of honors classes. If you're getting distinction for being in an honors class, it's because you've gone above and beyond what the curriculum should require. So it's just a suggestion. I don't know if that's something they've looked into, but I'd like to see some consistency. And, and of course, the consistency comes with, if I'm an honors student at Terrebonne, and I have a cousin that's an honors student at Bourgeois, but I'm working twice as hard at Terrebonne in my honors classes than they are, and then when we graduate, we get the same amount of credit for that class, there's some disparity where it should be consistent and it should be competitive. So it was brought up earlier, I've been holding on to that comment, I wasn't sure if it was the right time or not, but I definitely want to mention it. Thank you. Uh, oh, Mr. Lagarde, do you have a question? I, just a clarification, because I've never seen this before, I've collected data for grants on gifted and talented. I saw that it separated Gifted is one number, talented is another. I thought it just went together. Mm -mm. So for clarification, what's the difference between right. the two? Uh, the gifted would be those that are being serviced in math, so core subjects. Talented would be uh, theater and drama. Okay. And, and music. And yes. Arts. Yeah. yes. Art and music. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. All right. Uh, federal updates. So um, summer learning program. 
Last year, we had 939 students apply for the program. This year, we've had 1,500. We're, we're about 1,500 in. I put 1,600 because we were adding some, but we're at about 1,500, and that's servicing grades pre-K to eight. Uh, we have about 73 regular ed teachers hired, as well as additional staff. Each site has a para, special ed teacher, um, L teachers, one L teacher on the west, one L teacher on the east, as well as L translators. Uh, we have five sites. I have the sites listed. Um, Grand Cayu Middle and Lisa Park are your sites that have fifth through eighth grade. The other sites are elementary. Field trips weekly, ecology-based STEM kits, um, hands-on activities, as well as balance between academics, interventions, experiments, and outdoor activities. So that's pretty much the summer learning program uh, in a nutshell. I visited all the sites, um, and I'm a little disappointed because I went to one site today and it didn't have the attendance that I was expecting to have. We're having better attendance at the elementary sites with those kids. Um, the middle, it's touch and go. Some days they're there, some days they're not. Can you tell me the site? Uh, that was Grand Cayu Middle. Um, McKinney Vento and Migrant Programs. Our McKinney Vento program has expanded exponentially due to Hurricane Ida. We usually, the homeless program, it's referred to as McKinney Vento. Uh, we went from having 600 about average every year to this year about 1,800 families. So that money you were asking about, that's some of that homeless, that ARP incentive money, mm -hmm. that's for that homeless McKinney Vento program, okay? okay? Um, that was the increase, in other words, yes, because of that. Yes, yes. Um, the migrant program as well, what we've done with those two programs just recently, we did a uniform voucher giveaway where we couldn't do it at federal because we don't have the facilities. One of our buildings is leveled, um, but we were able to have it at the um, West Homa gym, and we gave out vouchers to Jake's uniforms for $100 to families for those kids that qualify and that are in the program. And it was a tremendous hit. So that's one of the things we did with that, that new funding. Um, but we gave out over 650 so far of the thousand that qualified in McKinney Vento and 150 out of 280 in Migrant. They were very appreciative. So that would be something that I would like to continue annually and let the parents go and pick out the things that they need at Jake's. Um, summer learning kits as well as scholastic summer readers have been distributed to families in both programs. And we've asked them to send in pictures of the students doing the kits so that way we could recognize and do a raffle and increase participation in those kids actually doing the kits. So we've been getting some pictures and we're looking forward to being able to you know, raffle off a prize that we purchased for them. The L program. Some of the, we have five L teachers for the district. They will be based at three of the high schools next year and Oakland Middle, meaning they will not be based at federal. They will only go to federal on Friday afternoons between 1 and 3 p.m. to have PLCs with me or any other paperwork or documentation they need to do. They will be servicing students. What we've done at the high schools, um, Ellender, Terrebonne High, and HL Bourgeois, we've created classes based on their ELP scores. Those kids that are emerging, level ones and twos are newcomers in the country, will be serviced by a teacher every day. And we've got the, the, the principals to set up those teachers with a class at second period every morning. So those L teachers will work eight to three and they will start their morning there at those high schools or at that, uh, or at that middle school. And they will service that population. We're looking at a curriculum called Learning Tree for them to be able to utilize that to where it's not basic um, kitty, it's more on a higher level that kids won't be embarrassed to use. Because right now we find those L students when you, when you 
when they're using Imagine Learning, it's really geared for younger kids. So they're not real interested in doing that program. So we feel that this will better meet the needs of those kids. And instead of being serviced one time a week, they're gonna be serviced every day. And this is a, a subgroup population that we're really worried about. You know, we really need to pay attention to these kids. So this, I think, will be very fruitful. Um, Oaklawn, we chose Oaklawn because that is a school that is, that is our CIR, you, CIR school, Comprehensive Needs Assessment. You know, it's, it's, it's that school. They have a large population of L students. So the teacher will do that class and then they will go to the other schools and service the other kids. Now those elementary schools that have high numbers, um, that's Acadian, Honduras, Cotabaya, Blue Village East, and Grand Caillou, there will be an L para at each school there, utilizing Title III funds, okay? Um, they will meet the needs of those kids as well as those teachers going and meeting with those paras and having those conversations and adjusting instruction as they should. But those paras will directly be servicing those kids at those schools. Sure. Yes? Do the, do the paras speak a second language or The translators do. Uh, we have one para that is fluent and she's gonna be at Grand Caillou wow. Elementary. Just yes. Yes. It's hard to find translators, much less, you know, Paris. Yeah. Our pre-K pro program right now, um, we are actually up about 50 students from where we were last year, so that's wow. good. Um, we have 540 qualified. Um, we've requested 770 seats based on the number of kids who would qualify, but we really have room for about 820. Um, early childhood, we'll continue working with coaching um, caregivers and teachers at the early learning child care centers. Uh, we, are, we are the lead agency. Um, we'll, we're, we're trying to improve access to quality child care for children, whether they be in our pre-K pre classes or they be in early child care because they're all our kids. They're gonna be our kids. Um, and we're gonna continue to provide those resources and materials to those centers and coaching through some of the grants that we receive. The centers do a really good job responding. Yes, we actually have, right, a teacher who's a coach that actually goes to the centers and does the coaching. Um, that's, that's really all I have on federal. Are there any questions? Mr. Hamner has a question. First off, I want to say I taught that little girl. <laughs> and that little girl, I know, but I was about to, and, and I taught that little girl over there. And Corey, refresh me, did I teach you or your brother? The brother, yeah. Uh, thank God I didn't That's teach why you. I'm terrible in math. <laughs> <laughs> they, they did excellent jobs, thank y'all. Uh, uh, Cheryl, if we're successful, I know one of Superintendent Armstrong's future goals is to have universal pre-K across the parish uh, for everybody, not just those who qualify under the federal mm -hmm. guidelines. If we're successful in implementing that, uh, what, what do you think that number will go up to? Um, oh, or, we were talking oh, about possibly 250 kids. More? Mm -hmm. So from 800 to um, a about 1,000. A thousand. Thousand. Mm -hmm. That's pretty doable. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, board. I think it's going to be higher than that because when people find out we have universal <laughs> pre-K, they're going to come to this community. But I do want to say this. You might be right. I, I am proud of how we're dealing with our immigrant students. And, and, and look, they're coming to this district and they don't want to leave because they're feeling, they feel accommodated. They feel welcome. So I want to put it out there. If, if there's people out there in Lafourche and they're not really feeling it, St. Charles, St. Mary, they want somewhere for their kids to go and they want to take up residency, come on over to Terrebonne Parish because we will, we will welcome them with open arms and we will make them into good citizens and responsible young people. That's what we want. Where are you going to be? Hey, we'll find a place. Yeah.
Um, one question that I had for you, talking about the centers, are you talking about like Head Start centers or? Head Start's is part of it, but like Little Imaginations. Oh, so, so even privately owned yes. child care yes, centers. Oh, that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful mm -hmm. that you're reaching out to all those. That's great. Right. Anybody else questions? All right. Thank you. Okay. Oh, one more, child welfare. Good evening. Good evening. Our uh, part of the presentation focuses on three important uh, priorities under the child welfare and attendance umbrella. School safety, attendance, and discipline. As it relates to school safety, prior to any recent events involving violence in school, our district has already implemented single points of entry uh, in all of our schools. There will continue to be a fine tuning of those mechanisms as it relates to the buzzer and door connectivity, but the main process of entry into a single point has already been implemented. There is also consideration of the implementation of metal detectors at the middle, junior high, and high schools through possible grant funding, which applies to this type of security. Additionally, the district has partnered with the Louisiana State Police Crime Stoppers to implement an application for the notification of threats of violence, bullying, and other incidents of concern to students, parents, and the community. Prior to that, the district also partnered with the state of Louisiana for the implementation of the Ray Panic Button, an application for the alert and reporting of a critical incident that could occur in a school setting. As it relates to attendance, the district through the Child Welfare and Attendance Department has always had a strong reduction, uh, truancy reduction program. Included in your folder are the guidelines for the truancy reduction intervention program that is facilitated by the district attorney's office. And after intentional discussion and collaboration between them and our district, uh, beginning with the 2021-22 school year, TRIP has moved to more of a family-focused case management and support process for each identified truant student. You can read through any other particulars or specifics uh, in your handout. And lastly, uh, discipline. In addressing discipline, there is a combination of a multi-tiered system of support that includes positive behavior interventions and supports and a consistent guidance and professional learning for our system principals who mainly handle the, the discipline uh, in schools and our school counselors who provide additional group and or one-on-one support to address student academic and behavioral success. The Child Welfare and Attendance Office has pro provided you with information on multi-tiered systems of support, PBIS, the assistant principal PLCs, and school counselor PLCs for, further, for your further reference. Additionally, the Child Welfare and Attendance Office provides training to the administrator, staff, and students of the schools of our district. As you can see from the pictures on the slide, that one, um, of the Capturing Kids Hearts training we had this month and the handouts in your folder, these types of training are as important and vital to the growth and success of our students, teachers, and administrators. Any questions? Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Any questions? Yes, Dr. Trahan. Just one point of concern that's been brought to my attention uh, just recently. Uh, the questions some of my constituents are having about Ellender and South Terrebonne modulars that we're going to be starting to utilize as campuses this school, upcoming school year. How do we ensure the safety on that so on that in those modulars for our students so what we'll do um, the office of child welfare and attendance along with the administrators um, will get together um, and um, schools already create a crisis management mm -hmm. plan uh, so we want to make sure that those crisis management plans for those schools are specific to now having modulars on the campus for example a, a single point of entry is that possible Oh, I didn't know that. So we will have single point of entry. Okay. 
Who wasn't aware of that? Uh, I'm waiting for that walkthrough to be rescheduled. <laughs> yes, sir. So Capture and Kids Hearts, um, if you look in your folders, I, I included some information. Um, it is a uh, behavioral support program um, that schools participate in and have been uh, for many years in this district. I was trained as a teacher, Capture and Kids Hearts. And so we've, what we've done, uh, we began with our UIRD schools. Um, that's the schools that have issues, uh, more issues than dis with discipline than most schools. And we implemented that process with them to address um, that concern. Um, and it's about connecting, um, having relationships with students and teachers uh, so that you have a better culture and climate in your school. Um, so we began with those schools and each year uh, through our Title IV budget, we're able to um, add more schools um, each year and so this year this summer was Berg, um, Lacache, um, and uh, Cotobaya Blue and two of those schools the principals requested uh, that training after we gave them a little uh, insight on what we're doing in the other schools. It's great. Uh, yes, Ms. Silvite. I guess this just shows how old I am because uh, <laughs> Excellent. Great. Mr. Ford. So regarding safety and single point entry, there, there are a couple of problem areas on in the district. Uh, specifically, I'll, I'll mention more in Terrebonne High, and we looked at this earlier uh, a couple of months ago at the end of the school year. One of the things that I'd like to see, if we ever get to the point where we have an SRO on every campus, that would be great, but the campuses we do have SROs on, I would like to see those SROs as the first person that someone sees when they enter campus. <clears throat> the reason why, I don't know if you guys have ever looked into it or studied, but uh, when it comes to policing, 80% of policing is being a deterrent, right? That's the reason why uh, there's uniforms, there's the reason why deputies drive marked vehicles with lights on them and stickers, because when people see those vehicles, they see those people in uniform, they're less likely to, to commit a crime. Well, if we have our campuses where we have security or SROs or whoever's on campus that's responsible for the safekeeping of that schoolhouse and those kids, if that's the first person someone sees when they enter campus, they're less likely to do something to bring harm to anyone. So in the situation like at Terrebonne High, uh, Mr. Ogeron and I looked at, uh, sometime in May at where the SRO is stationed. Right, so right now, currently, over the last couple of years, he's been in the second floor in the administrative offices. Well, there's a space right near the main entrance that he could be utilizing as an office, and he would be essentially the first person anyone would see when coming on campus. So that's just one scenario. At HL Bourgeois, when I go there, 80% of the time, the SRO is one of the first people I see because he's, his office is right next to the administrative office and he hovers in that area. But that's not the case on all campuses. So I'd really like to see a push to do that to where we get these officers, SROs, at that single point entry or at least as close to it as possible so they can be that deterrent that we need them to be. Mm -hmm. Good idea. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Yes, Appreciate it. Yeah, I think we're, I think we're done. Yeah, motion to, motion to adjourn by Mr. Ford, One second statement. by Dr. Trahan. Oh, you have something to say? Uh, I just want to thank all of you working so hard for this presentation. It, it's why I became a school board member instead of this, all this other stuff we deal with. The teacher in me is singing right now with all this information. I would really appreciate it if the information, the slides could be forwarded or emailed to us. 
so we could have it to sit and look at thoroughly. Uh, it, it's a pleasure to listen to this presentation. Thank you, all of you. Thank you, Dr. Tron. Yes, Mr. Yeah, same thing, because now we, we know what's going on. A lot mm -hmm. of times we didn't know what's going Absolutely. on. You know, and, and we Absolutely. And know what's happening in the schools from the people. So I, Absolutely. I like this. Very good. So thank you all. Okay, so uh, we had a motion to adjourn by Mr. Ford, second by Dr. Trahan. Public comment? Any objections? Okay. Thank you all. Adjourned. Yeah. <laughs>